Last time I think I saw you all was, you want me to hold this thing? All right. Last time I saw you all was um, Tuesday. We had an awesome Fat Tuesday party, my very first church-hosted Fat Tuesday party that I've ever been to, and it was amazing and fun. Uh, and Fat Tuesday was the big feast that kicked off uh, the season of Lent, which was uh, it's 40 days to remember Jesus and how he laid aside heaven, laid down his life for us. He gave up everything uh, to bring us to himself. And one of the traditions that goes with Lent is this idea of giving something up in remembering what Jesus did for us. I kind of have mixed feelings about it, to be completely honest. I, I've tried it for years. Um, I became a Christian 20 years ago, and then I went off to Bible school, and everybody did this Lent thing. And so I decided to hop on board and kind of ask around at what other people were doing. And uh, they said stuff like, well, you could give up, like, sweets or chocolate, you know? You made that New Year's resolution to get healthier and to lose weight, and, and that fell off about January 15th. And Lent comes around, and you can kind of reinvigorate that by giving up sweets and chocolate. And uh, so I tried that, and, and I don't think I made it 40 days on that one. Um, and then I figured, well, maybe I should pick something dear to me. So, so one year I gave up coffee, uh, very dear to me. And uh, I was successful at that. Yay me. Uh, I gave up coffee, and uh, as soon as that was over, I had to curb my addiction to Mountain Dew that had to drop <laughs> during those 40 days. But maybe, and then I, I kind of finally settled in on this thing of, now I just give up giving up things. Um, and I, I settled into it because I, I just didn't feel like the Lord was deeply concerned with my level of caffeine or my sugar intake. Um, and then that kind of just stayed dormant for a while until this series popped up that we're going to be doing uh, as pastors here at this church. And, and we posed the question, what if God was to actually ask us to give up something that he wanted us to give up? What, what would that fill in the blank be? And I thought it was a pretty worthy question. Um, and I knew I had to take the very first week because we have really cool pastors around here who come up with really good ideas and I figure if I go first I don't have to follow them so, and they wouldn't take my ideas um, but also God had kind of already been stirring this thing in my heart of like what's really at the core of this idea of giving stuff up and he'd been kind of stirring a message in and to me what it looks like is John 10 10 is one of my favorite verses it says I come that you might have a life and that you might have it abundantly. And I think there are times where God says, you know what, I want you to give up this one thing so that you can step into this incredible abundant life that I want to give you. But in order to get it, you're going to have to have to lay down something that you're already carrying. Um, today, the answer to that question that I would like to pose, that if God was to say, what it is it that you would give up if you were going to give up one thing, it would be this, give up yourself. And uh, the passage we're going to look at as we kind of explore this idea is Matthew 16, 24 through 27. Um, is it on the screen for the next slide? Cool. I'm going to read it off of there because I don't know if Jeremy and I got in sync on our translation and all that. But you got it up there and I got it up there, so let me read it for us. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whatever loses their life for me will find it. What good would it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? So we're focusing on verse 25. I'm going to just read it again slowly. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. I'm going to... Um, give you my impression of, of what it was like for maybe the disciples as they heard Jesus say that. They're like, wait a minute, what did he just say? Whoever would save their life will lose it. Whoever would lose their life will save it. That makes no sense. Jesus said another one of those really, really deep things, like sand through the hourglass of our lives, so are the days of our lives. You know, like, stuff like that. But Jesus said these things, and, and people go, all right, write it down, Matthew. Can somebody write this down? Because we're going to have to figure it out later. And then they would kind of go on uh, and do their ministry, and they just didn't get it. Um, I don't think that that's an atypical reaction, because frankly, as I did this Bible study initially, I kind of read that, and I'm like, man, that's deep. 
And then ADD kicked in and I'm like, hmm, grocery list. Uh, other things I gotta get done today. Where's my coffee? And moving on. And I think sometimes that's how this passage comes across. What does it mean? Lose your life, find it. Lose your life for Christ's sake and find it and save your life and lose it. Just, it seems crazy deep. So um, I'm gonna pray for us real quick, ask for the Holy Spirit to help kind of teach us that passage. And then uh, I want to ask you a question. So let's pray. God, um, it is only through your Holy Spirit that we find what this word might mean for our lives. Uh, it's not about the guy up there talking. But I, Lord, I pray that you would minister to us, that you would unfold these verses, that you would teach us what Jesus means by them. We love you, Lord. Amen. So here's my question. What does a perfect day look like to you? And it's not a hypothetical question. I'm actually going to ask you to like throw some stuff out. What would a perfect day be for you? Beautiful summit on a mountain. Summit on a mountain. Nice. So you're hiking up there. You get there. You see this incredible, beautiful view. A waterfall. A waterfall. Beautiful. A perfect cast for a steel. A perfect cast for a steel. I don't even know what that is, but it sounds cool. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Going to work. A great day at work. 36 holes at Palm Desert. 36 <laughs> holes at Palm Desert. 70, uh, 70 degree breeze and salt. Mmm. Nice. A beautiful day. Maybe a day at the spa, someone to take the kids. I don't know what's on your list of what makes a perfect day. Um, I heard the most interesting answer to that question from an old seminary professor of mine, a guy by the name of Jeff Cuse, teaches at SPU, cool guy. And uh, he asked me to ponder the answer to that question being, a day where you didn't think about yourself at all. And that's kind of stuck with me. And, I, and as I think about my own life and, and looking back, I can think about times where maybe I was on a mission trip or something and I got to serve some other people or something came up and I got to help someone move and for that period of time, I didn't think about myself at all. It was just being there, doing something for somebody else, and that brought me tremendous joy. Um, I think the same is true as we think about these things like a beautiful view or a warm day. There's something that enfolds you or where it so enfolds you that for that time, you're not worried about bills, not worried about this or that. You're not figuring something out. You are just enfolded by what is going on around you, and your thoughts aren't even on yourself. You're caught up in something. You lose yourself in a way. I have a friend who I think uh, characterizes this losing yourself and, and just being enfolded with what's going on around him very well. Uh, it's a friend of mine that I refer to often named Cindy Foster, and she's the type of person who is totally focused on the person who's in front of her. Um, You'll engage her in conversation, and she will ask you question after question, genuinely interested about you. Um, and it'll be a half an hour before you realize that you have no clue how she's doing whatsoever, because you haven't been able to ask her a question at all. But she's genuinely interested. She's not avoiding it. And then you ask her, and she gives you a quick answer, and then she's back on, what can I do for you? Who are you? How are you? This uh, message about losing ourselves and what that might mean in Christ kind of came up for me on a particularly difficult day at work. Uh, I have people at my work that I just don't get along with, clash of personalities. I uh, get along with most people pretty well, but there's one guy who just, I'm his sliver and he's mine. And it just, we just grade on each other. And I was having a conversation with one of my friends at work and I was realizing as I was talking that all I was doing was probably bringing down this other person with my whiny stories. This had not been the first time we had this conversation, and it wasn't a need to vent. It was just me recycling the same stuff, and it was getting redundant. And all I was going to end up with was bumming myself out, bumming her out. There was nothing that she could say that would have made it better for me. And it was just a pointless conversation. And so I, I literally think the Holy Spirit stopped me in my tracks, and I just stopped and I said, I don't feel like whining about myself. Uh, what's going on with you? And for the next 20 or so minutes, I got to hear about her kid and how her kid was trying to pick what rodeo club to be a part of 
and there was only one rodeo club, and she was probably going to lose all the races if she joined it, and was it a good idea or not? I had no input on the subject. I've never done rodeo, nor looked forward to doing rodeo. But for that 20 to 30 minutes, I was available to God for this other person, and I was focused on her, and I was free from myself. It brought me joy in the middle of that situation, and it stopped the tracks. And it was then that I stumbled across this idea that maybe we all have an addiction to me. And that addiction, I call it an addiction because I feel like an addiction is something that you keep coming back to that just sucks the life out of you. And being a me-focused person can suck the life out of us. And I think that's what Christ is beginning to talk about. And it comes across in so many ways. And I think John brought it up a couple weeks ago. He said it's like undertow. There's this thing that just, I grew up in Ventura, California. The, t the current, and there's an undertow a lot. And if you dive under the water, the current will just pull you out further away from the beach. And if you aren't careful, you'll find yourself in a totally different place and not where you need to be. Or maybe like a whirlpool that just kind of drags you in, and that's the current that we live in. It's this current that wants to pull us away from God, towards ourself, and away from others, and towards ourself. It shows up in all sorts of ways, and uh, I like to think of it like my suitcase here. Uh, for some of us, it's like worry, you know, we get, uh, our concerns are going on in our life, and we're like, oh, I gotta worry about this, I gotta worry about that, I gotta worry about this, and we... We carry it around. That's our, our self-luggage that we have. I'm going to attempt to open said luggage. Sorry, dear. I'm wrecking our luggage as we speak. Or church. For God. Um, there's my worry. I got my worry with me. Uh, for others of us, I feel like it's... Uh, Worry is, by the way, just trying to control stuff in your life that doesn't feel like it's under your control. So we think that worrying about it will help. For others of us, maybe it's wrath, you know, or disappointment or bitterness. All of those come about as things happen to us that we feel like, you know, we don't deserve that. Life did not accommodate to my desires. It's a very me-centered spot. It's understandable considering some situations, but we feel like, man... I just got this wrath, this disappointment, or this bitterness, or this depression that will come about because there's this thing that isn't fitting what I wanted. Throw that in here. Image. It feels like we're thinking about other people when we're like, well, I wonder what they think of me. I'm a total people pleaser, by the way. It's probably my biggest downfall. But I will sit there and I will worry about what each of you thinks about me for the next three to four hours of my life after this is all over. I appear to be confident, totally not, people pleaser. So I'm sitting there worrying, oh, I wonder what they thought. Did they like it? Am I making the people around me happy? Maybe it's uh, another one of my favorites, introspection and analysis. Where am I supposed to be in my life? Am I accomplishing everything I'm supposed to accomplish? Am I where I should be? Is everything good? So I do a lot of navel gazing and writing. I uh, heard this song lyric. It says, I've overthought everything I can think of. <laughs> and I thought, and I was like, that is so me. I just sit there and like mill around on the same stuff over and over and over. But at the end of the day, what am I thinking about? Me, my stuff, my situation. Uh, I think it can even pop up in prayer, which is weird. I'm totally for bringing everything that's on our hearts to God. But I've noticed in my prayer life, when I get very self-focused, most of it is asking God or telling God what he should be doing. Because if I ran the universe, it would significantly be better. Um, and what happens when we flip that on its head and we say, Lord, where do you want to use me? What's your will? What do you want? All of a sudden, we've taken the center of our lives and put it somewhere else. And I think after we get our suitcase packed up of all of our me stuff, Jesus is sitting there saying, all right, come follow me. I got this, this thing I want you to do. And we go, all right, Lord, I'm ready. I'm even packed. <laughs> Jesus says, we're going to run a race. You're going to carry that? Well, it has wheels. <laughs> I've gotten really used to it. This is all the stuff that I like to carry with me, and, and this is how I function. So, yeah, I, I'm going to bring this. And Jesus says, you know what? What if you were to lose that? Leave it behind. 
and let's see what we can run into. And then he gives us three steps, three simple things that we can do. Deny ourselves is the very first thing in that passage. Whoever wants to be my disciple will deny themselves. It takes moving us out of the center. It takes moving away from this idea that if I just had one more thing, I could be happy. Now, I don't know what that thing is for you. I think we all have it. I kind of wish all of us would get it because I think we'd just move on to something else and we'd realize that that one thing wouldn't make us happy. But maybe if I had a bigger house or a better house or a better job or a partner or I didn't have this partner or I would never say that about you, dear. Um, <laughs> a more likable boss a better job situation, a job situation, than in all those places, or if my kids were more supportive or being easier. We have these things that are on our list, but maybe God's saying, get rid of the list. Deny yourself. Stop worrying about yourself and do something else. Jesus is offering us a fork in the road where we can go, you know what? I'm tired of self. I'm going to let that go, and I'm going to focus on something else. It's putting something down. It's leaving the suitcase behind and saying, all right, I'm going to run where you want to have me run. I started this experiment as of Wednesday. Uh, I, that was the day I started writing the sermon, so it was a little easier to get it in my head. Uh, but it was also the start of Lent. And I decided I'm not going to be self-focused. That's what I'm going to give up for Lent. I'm going to actually attempt to do what I'm preaching. And i got to tell you, it is hard. Like 10 to 15 times a day minimum, I'm sitting there going, it's all about me again. All right. Shove that off. Uh, I went on a date with Christina. We went to a movie and dinner, and I realized the entire car right there, I was telling her all the insights I had gained from not thinking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have a clue what was going on in my wife's life because I was so focused on sharing with her all the wonderful ways that God is teaching me right now. Obviously, I'm a newbie at this. I'm still learning. But deny yourself. That's Jesus' starting point. Try and get the focus back on God and others. He said, if you want to sum up all the law and all the prophets, what are you going to do? There's two commands that will sum up all of it. Love the Lord your God with all of who you are and love others. That's it. It's quite simple. So incredibly hard to do. But it's just about moving that center off of yourself to others. So we deny ourselves, and then what? We put down that other thing, and then what? Jesus says, I got something for you to take up. Take up your cross daily. Doesn't that sound fun? Um, this is a horribly misunderstood and misused passage. Uh, the cross is the place where Jesus died. It's a place of Roman torture and suffering. And I think most of the time that I've heard about this term of, like, take up your cross daily, and then come follow me. I've usually heard it as described as anything that is painful and difficult in your life, that is what you get to carry. And I don't think that that's actually what Jesus meant when he said this. And I think that that actually doesn't lead to very good things. Um, whatever's hard or not likable, um, my in-laws, I love your family, dear. Uh, my in-laws, my ADD, my struggle, my sickness, whatever it is, I think when we say, well, that's my cross, I think what we do is we actually stop looking at what God can do in that situation, and we just let it take up permanent residence in our life, and we stop allowing God to minister to it. We figure, that's something that God said, all right, I'm done with. I'm assigning this to you, so you carry it. And then we end up burdened, yet again. The other thing that I think that it does is, is it brings us to a place where we blame God for all sorts of stuff that has nothing to do with what he wants for our lives. We live in a broken world. I make terrible choices all the time. And as a result of those choices, sometimes things do not work out well, i.e. this guy that I can't get along with at work. I fight with him all the time. It doesn't lead to good things. And I could say, well, he's my cross at work. <laughs> But maybe God has something better for me to do with that besides that. Um, we end up calling things that other people, other choices that other people make that bring about hardship in our life. We go, well, that's my cross. My dad was a jerk, or my mom was a jerk, or this other person is a jerk, and, and so now I have this cross to bear. And we, we, we basically say, well, that's what God gave me. I don't know if that's fair. 
I don't think it allows God to be God when we do that. We live in a broken, messed up world. It's going to have brokenness that comes into our lives. That's not what the cross is. That's not what Jesus is saying. You are assigned to carry. So let me give you a different way of considering it. The passage right before this, Jana brought it up a couple weeks ago. We look at context. We look at what's before and what's after a passage if we want to understand it. Context right before this, uh, Jesus is saying, guess what, guys? God's will for my life is that I am going to have to suffer and die for the world. And Peter's response is, no way, Lord. There's no way you don't have to do that. Stay safe. Stay comfortable. We can keep hanging out. Don't go to the cross. And Jesus turns to him and says, you know what? What you have in mind is a plan from man. It's not a plan from God. This is God's will for me. Right after this passage uh, is the story of the transfiguration. It's a story of glory. It's kind of like a precursor about what's about to happen at the cross. At the cross, Jesus died. Three days later, he rose again and was seen in his glory. And these guys, after they hear this terrible thing that Jesus is about to do, go to a cross and die, and he says, that's, my, that's God's will for my life. Here's what it's going to lead to. He goes up on a mountain, and he reveals himself as God in flesh. All of his glory is revealed to them. What if the cross was actually viewed as simply God's will for your life? Take up your cross. Maybe it isn't take up being a martyr, or take up your suffering and just stay there. Maybe it's take up God's will for your life. It might lead to some suffering sometimes, but it'll always lead to glory. It'll always go to places where God gets revealed more and more, and God does beautiful things. As I kind of played with that thought a little more and did some more research, one of the things that I found out about the cross was it was a symbol that the Romans used. If you were a criminal, and you had broken some law, you had stolen, or you had uh, tried to kill a Roman soldier, or whatnot. Uh, the last thing you would do in this life was you would carry your cross to your own crucifixion. The reason they had them carry this cross through town was not just because it was heavy and they didn't feel like carrying it. The reason they had to carry the cross was because it was a sign that you were back under the burden of Roman rule. You were no longer a rebel. Rebels were not tolerated. So your last act was to show that you were back under the rule and leading of the Roman government. When Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, he's saying, take up God's will and follow me. That's what I have for you. And when we start to go down that road, and when we start to figure out what does actually God want us to carry, we come across cool passages like Matthew eleven twenty eight that says, Come, take my burden on you. You'll find that it's easy and it's light. And you can find rest for your weary souls. What God is doing is he's inviting us to live a totally different life than just for ourselves, focused on ourselves, but to say, God, what do you want? Who can I serve today? What spot do you have for me? And when we do that, yeah, we take on some new burdens, but they're beautiful. They bring glory and they bring life to us, even if they're hard. I wasn't excited when John called me yesterday morning and said, Chris, can you do a memorial for me? Uh, I know you'd offered. And I said, John, I don't know the guy's name. And he said, well, I think it's written on a note on my desk. <laughs> um, and I immediately sent off a text to Jana saying, hey, Jana, how do you feel about doing a memorial? <laughs> um, but after I talked to John and, and talked to Jana, she was willing to, by the way, even though she didn't have anything prepared, it was fantastic. But um, as I talked to John and realized, you know what, this is something that God gave me to do. I think I need to do this. It ended up being the high point of my day. It was fantastic. People were served. I got to forget about myself for a bit and do something that I love to do. As we choose God's will, as we choose his rule in our life, as we take up that cross, we'll find that it is actually better than the other stuff that we want. We want more money. We want more comfort. We want security. We want nice views, we want all that other stuff, but maybe there's surprises that God has in store that might be even better. So we're given a choice, live for ourselves or deny ourselves and set that aside and then take up our cross, whatever God's will is for us at that moment and do that instead. Then Jesus gave us one more thing. I'm going to wrap up with this. 
Come follow me. There's an old uh, saying, and it's this. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. And um, it came from people who were following a rabbi would want to be like them. Simply that. They would, they would follow him around and they would hang out with him for a year on end. It was what Jesus was doing with his disciples. And uh, they, would, they would sit there and they would go, well, he eats this. I guess I'll eat that. He says stuff like this. Okay, I'm going to listen to him until I start to say stuff like that too. I want to see how he acts, how he interacts with this people and these people and that people. What are the stuff that he does? Because I'm going to learn to do life like he does it. And it can't be done from looking at Jesus from way far off. It gets done as we go, Jesus, I'm going to follow you, so I'm going to strain close. I'm going to be so close to you that as you walk, that dust that comes off of your sandals is going to be on me. And then I'm going to start to talk like you and look like you. And I'm going to say life-giving things like you said life-giving things. Jesus said in uh, John 14, I believe it is, the vine and the branches, he said, you know, if you are connected with me, if you're that close to me that we're connected, you're going to bear much fruit. But apart from me, you're not going to be able to do anything. You're not going to have this life, this abundant life I want to give you. So may we be people like that, strain to be close to the Lord, know the things that he said and did, interact with them on a daily basis so that the dust of him comes off on us and we get to be more and more like him. It's a beautiful life to live. These three things, deny yourself, take up your cross, whatever God's will is for you, and then come follow me. That's the recipe for breaking the addiction to me. And it leads us away from a self-satisfying, self-glorifying life into a life that can be what God intended, that can bear fruit for the people around us and where we can live abundant lives. So how does that work out practically? I think it's little things. I've been pondering that a lot. I'm like, does that mean that we need to sell everything, or should I quit my job and, and go into ministry? Or does that mean that maybe uh, I should be like Mother Teresa and just go find the most hopeless situation I can find and, and go live there? Like, what does this mean to do this? And I think it actually happens in small moments and little shifts where the Holy Spirit nudges us a little bit and where we decide instead of whining about ourselves, we're going to try to be a good listener for a few minutes. Um, Last week, Thursday, uh, was the elders meeting. And we were sitting in a room, and I was sitting there and looking around and going, these are a bunch of people who just worked a full day, had other things going on in their life, and they said, I'm going to give up Thursday night to consider what God might want to do at Harbor Church. And they put their passion and their thought and their heart into it, and it was beautiful. And I think they genuinely enjoyed doing it, too. I think it proves some of this glory that comes out of giving our lives. Uh, another thing it might look like is Wednesday morning we have a, a gathering of guys. We get together and we consider the word. And, and uh, one day afterwards, I decide to go use the restroom. And I walk in there and Dave's over there cleaning the bathroom because he doesn't want the next guy to come in there and get grossed out. <laughs> no glorification there, but here's the beauty of it. He just said, yeah, it needs to get done. It's for the Lord, I'll do it. And I think that actually becomes meaningful, joyful things in our lives. As I was writing this sermon, I was sitting in a coffee shop. I had been there a while, and it was uh, uncomfortable sitting at the little one-person seat. And then this guy got up and left, and he left this nice booth where I could spread out all my stuff, and I had a plug for my computer, and I could keep writing my sermon. And I was there for maybe 15, 20 minutes writing, and I was happy as can be. And then these teenagers rolled in, and it's like four of them. And they were all friends. And uh, they're walking around. They've made a whole loop of the place. And they realize there's no booth. I'm sitting there going, shoot. And I'm writing a sermon on giving up things for yourself. <laughs> and my seat over at the bar is still there. <sighs> Fine. And so I unplugged my computer and I let them have my booth. And they probably thought I was really nice. But really what it was about for me was... I don't want this to be about me. I want it to be about somebody else. And after I gave up my seat and I looked over and they were chatting, I realized, you know what? I have no clue what the sermon is going to produce. 
It's good. I enjoy doing stuff like that. But I know at least today, some kids got to sit down and hang out at a coffee shop because of me. And it brought a smile to my face. Maybe that's just the little things. I don't want to say that to brag or anything like that. But we decentralize ourselves. We make our lives about others. And then in the process, we find a life that God wants to give us. So my homework for you, seems how John gets to give homework. My thought for you, my question for you is, is what is one person this week that you could set aside yourself for, for a short period of time? And then will you do it? And will you tell me about it next week? Sound awesome? Cool. All right. Let me pray for us, and then uh, we'll have one more song and wrap up. God, thank you that you give us a choice besides living for self. Thank you that you love us and you invite us into a better life, a life with you and a life for others. Lord, give us your eyes as we go through this week to see people as you see them, to see opportunities as you see them. Give us your heart for other people. Help us to set aside our thoughts and our dedication to ourselves for a short time and do something for you. And may it bring us joy in life. God, you're good to us and we love you. Thanks for freeing us from ourselves and freeing us from the addiction of me. Amen.